Our next speaker is Shafak Pavi, uh, a member of the Turkish Parliament for the main opposition Social Democratic Party. She serves on the EU-Turkey Ascension Committee and is a United Nations independent human rights expert. Uh, Shafak served with the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights as the head of the Secretariat and has worked for the UN Refugee Agency on humanitarian issues and missions in the Middle East, Southwest Asia, and Central Europe. After winning a parliamentary seat in June 2011, Shafak became the first disabled female parliamentarian and continues to advocate for the freedoms and rights of vulnerable populations, including women, children, LGBT people, and minority communities. Uh, she was awarded the 2014 Secularist of the Year by the UK's National Secular Society and won the 2012 International Woman of Courage Award. Please welcome Shavak Pave. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that introduction. Uh, but um, it's really, um, it's, it's a great feeling that I feel part of the family. And then after all these speeches, it's very difficult to be the last one. Uh, so I've been actually tweaking my speech, not to repeat things uh, so that, you know, it would be more complimentary. But it is really uh, great to see that we're not alone. Um, so I will be focusing more on the Turkish experience if you allow me, that I thought perhaps would be some food for thought. Of course, the end of the Cold War did not bring about a world free of polarized ideologies. We were all hoping that once the Berlin Wall fell, a new world would finally move beyond the conflict-prone past. It seemed that the Marxist legacy did not have anything else to offer to this new world, neither God. However, we, what we thought coming did not happen. Not only we face continuous conflicts, especially in my region, with the revival of religious traditions, God's role in politics was rekindled. We thought that the time for belief systems which derive their eternal authority from God is over, but we were wrong. The current administration of Turkey, which was shown as an example of a modern Islamic democracy, derives its considerable part of its mandate from the belief that they are carrying out God's mission of revenge from the old secular system. Islamism is a narcissist ideology, you were mentioning of narcissism, that has hijacked my country, the Middle East, and the Arab Spring, that was called that way, not only politically but culturally as well. This is how it creates the environment in which it sur survives and thrives, narcissism. Islamism uses narcissism as a mask against those who hate it and those who make it feel inferior. This giant ideological structure molds and directs its partisans with zero em empathy. This is why integration, this is why negotiation, and this is why the rapprochement between civilizations has utterly failed. Let us take the case of ISIS. It gave the Christians of Raqqa three options, convert to Islam, remain Christian and pay the protection tax of the non-Muslim believers and submit to strict rules or be prepared to die. Some of the rules include prohibitions on making repairs to churches, wearing the cross or other religious symbols outside church and ringing the church bell, all prohibitions. Turkey's Islamists have not implemented these restrictive practices, rules formally because they claim to be more civilized than ISIS. But in everyday life, they are all forbidden by social pressure anyways. People are discouraged through quiet repression by the streets. Our current situation is explained away so easily by Western intellectuals who used to highly praise Erdogan 10 years ago and now say that he has transformed into a tyrant. The latest conclusion of these international commentators who sing high praises to Islamic democracy is that democracy is befitting for our culture, but the problem is Erdogan's personality. I wouldn't make the mistake of underestimating him. Ever since he entered politics at a young age, 
Erdogan aimed to become head of state because he believed only he could change the infidel heretic social system that is a belief upheld by many political Islamists. And that is how the secular state is perceived by political Islamists. But if we attribute only to him the Islamic transformation of Turkey, then we pay him also two generous compliment. It would also be wrong to explain it by differences between right and left in the way that, as it is in Turkey's case, the left and right are far more complex. Altogether, the biggest cliff between left and right in our politics is religion. That is, whether you are pious or not, and not necessarily the policies that you suggest as a political movement. I can get more into this later if you have any questions. The cosmetic reforms that have been attributed to Erdogan and his government and brought him a high reputation in the world was actually a process of deceiving and impressing the West. Indeed, they melted away swiftly with the Islamic repressive structure. Many of them soon enough were revoked. Law came at the top of the list. Government supporters are granted privileges out of law and his enemies are given the harshest sentences by law. Formal law is no longer implemented. That is why, Carolyn, when you say law and secular law and constitution, it's not being implemented anymore. And it is not for the purpose anymore of delivering justice, but rather has become a means of punishment. It was only his Western counterparts who were hoping for someone with strong loyalties to Sharia law to abide the secular law as well. By now, they themselves must be amazed at how they could get it so wrong. AKP has transformed the Sunni identity into the dominant one through religious references. Addressing the West, AKP claimed that it was waging war on deeply rooted nationalism, but all the while, it was spreading a far worse ideology. In fact, any scholar who works on Turkey would know that the Middle Eastern style nationalism has to, has to rely on religious pillars, otherwise it cannot survive. At the beginning of this story, we had the best attempt at democracy that could come out of, it, of Islamic countries altogether. Despite its stumbling, stumbling phases and the tests of perseverance, we had to endure. AKP has been calling this political system the regime of secular elites who think it is their right to govern the republic. Yet political Islamists have been involved in various center-right organizations and have been the recipients of many privileges and have strengthened their presence progressively. To give you an example, some of the staff that has served Erdogan consists of ministers and high bureaucrats that have held these positions ever since they first became civil servants three decades ago. Turkey's political Islamists were not content with the symbiotic relations that they had created with the center-right parties. They worked diligently to overtake the host organization and reached managing positions with a perseverance that is praised and advised by Islam by the act of Takiye. My Iranian friend there will know. So we came to these days, the system that protected social rights and its liberties and was supported by a considerable number of people has been destroyed by an invisible bulldozer and the political Islamists have claimed absolute victory. In their eyes, the infidel heretic secular republic has been defeated. The most significant dynamic of the Islamic structure is its destruction of secular education. This issue is so important to Erdogan that he did not trust even his most loyal advisors with it. Instead, he put his son in charge of the Islamization of the education. In 2002, the number of pupils studying and graduating from the Imam Hatif cleric schools was 70,000. Now the number is one million. This number does not include the pupils who go to schools known as hidden cleric schools that are functioning in disguise of a regular public school. According to legal judicial investigation tapes, Bilal Erdogan, his son, has himself stated that the handful of the remaining pupils in the secular secondary education have been integrated in the hidden Imam Hatip cleric schools in order for them not to pose a threat to the Islamic regime in the future. 
Yet another policy devised by Erdoğan's son has been the creation of a fraudulent demand for Imam Hatip cleric schools through mosques and the media. They use propaganda very well. Women's behavior, the laughter of a young woman, how much beer a young man drinks, who shares a house with whom, and what kind of toilet they use, whether traditional or modern, they all have to be controlled in their eyes. Living arrangements outside the prescriptions of the holy book are not crimes, but are considered to be sins to be prevented. For instance, AKP politicians, you may not know this, have destroyed as many modern toilets as modern sculptures. Tradition dismisses the comforts of modern life far too easily and readily. Islamists define the morality of society in terms of woman's virtue. We have seen all those people who lost their lives. Women, woman's voice is seen as a threat. This is why in their eyes, girls and boys have to be segregated. Boys and girls cannot be on the same school grounds, and this includes university uh, dorms. My cousin has been a physics teacher for 20 years. During the last five years, she has made to leave her physics classes to a member of an Islamic tariqa order. She was told to remain at the teacher's room during her class time, so it looked as if physics was being taught at that hour, as stated in the curricula. For five years, those pupils learned nothing but about physics and all about jihad. She left incapable of changing the situation before she resigned. So just to wrap up, unfortunately, these hidden policies have been taken quietly and frequently, but now very openly. Now that Turkey has been off the tracks from its journey towards modernity, where does that leave us? The Islamists in Turkey are the, at the zenith of their power, yes. They can be a difficult partner and even threaten to become an enemy to the West. Hostility towards the West is part of the conspiracy discourse that is widespread all over the Middle East. Nonetheless, there are a significant number of people in Turkey who resist and strive for the existence of modern life. And the outcome of our survival struggle will have much bigger global consequences than the Western policymakers would like to think right now. Just imagine a Turkey without its seculars, without us. I could see, at the least, a Europe that is confined to its continent and a prison for us. No one can leave this woeful story with their head held high, said Danny Roderick, an academician. Not the, not the so-called secular military elite that governed the country, harshly for years, that scorned and yet used the Islamists, and thus single-handedly granting their reactionary attitude. Not the Turkey's Western friends that pretend not to see the colossal social liberty infringements. And certainly not the pretend intellectuals with their egregious interpretation of events that legitimize the butchering of secular law that Caroline was referring to and with the hope that Islam can produce moderate democracy. I want to finish my speech with a sentence from Turkey's Islamists. Those, I quote, those who expect Islam to reform wants us to give up our religion. We will not rise to the bait of the infidel. But I, be, I believe that we are strong because I know science, conscience, and arts is with us. And creative mind can resolve anything. Thank you very much.